Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, can't, I can't follow that, honestly. I don't think anyone has done a piece of research um, of the sort that Brooke has. And I don't think the kind of insights that you get from that um, can come in any other way. And so what I will present is, is not going to come close. The one thing I really you know, value um, in that, above all, apart from all of the fascinating detail that's in it, by the book, by the book. Um, <laughs> I didn't pay is, him to say that. <laughs> Yet, um, <laughs> the, uh, the idea that, you know, I, I have a lot of faith in changing law and policy, and I'm going to make the argument for, for doing that. But we can't ever think that there is a legal change that ends the game. It's a game the, the best analogy is capital controls. OK, if we don't update them every year or two, the people playing the game on the other side beat us. They outstrip us. They circumvent anything. It's always going to be an iterative process, so we can't kid ourselves that there's a silver bullet. But that said, we can go a long way to eliminating transactions in which one or other party is anonymous and the information role in that is kind of crucial. And for that, I would say that the title of this, Technical Challenges and Solutions for Taxing Wealth in Developing Countries, in some ways doesn't make sense because Taxing wealth isn't a problem uniquely to countries below a certain arbitrary per capita income level. You know, this is a global problem and it's a political one. It's largely a political question about how and, uh, and, in, and whether we want to tax wealth before we get to the technical questions. Um, and we can't only think that we're, we're dealing with a technical problem. Um, I mean, you know, in short, if you want to ask yourself, are you, are you serious about taxing wealth? Um, then the first thing you've got to ask is, well, do you want to do it? If the answer is no, then you've already got your answer. And in many <laughs> cases, that's where we are. If the answer is yes, then the question you ask yourself is, OK, do you know who owns the wealth that you want to tax? And if the answer is no, well, here we are again. You yeah. didn't do it. And that's as far as my diagram goes. I have no other lines on here. All right. That's, uh, that's the end. On three um, uh, lumps that kind of show you where the world is today, it's these three and we're all over there. So um, I will talk a bit about why we may not want to tax wealth and why we haven't done it and how that might be shifting and to the extent that it has shifted about, um, you know, some of the technical ways that we can uh, hope to make some progress. Um, but I'm also uh, contractually obliged to talk to you about the rise of tax justice, uh, mainly because it's, um, you know, the, the historical context for this. And it's a lot of the answer to the question of, uh, yeah. of the politics. Um, but um, with that framing, I'll talk about, you know, whether we should be trying to tax wealth um, and why we haven't uh, done in many cases before um, closing on some of those technical obstacles and solutions. Um, so. Thinking about um, the, the tax justice movement, if you like, uh, in some ways it goes back forever, um, but the kind of the modern period starts in the late 90s. Um, and you can see a couple of things happening there. So one is the, the OECD having one of their periodic attempts to crack down on tax havens. Um, and, and that was one of a series of things over a few decades where they, they didn't have an objective definition of what a tax haven was. In fact, nobody does to this day. We, um, as with Brooke, we tend to talk very much about secrecy jurisdictions rather than tax. It's the secrecy that's key. Um, but the OECD like to kind of put small jurisdictions up against a wall and beat them up a bit while doing nothing about its own members who are arguably and still arguably are a bigger part of the problem. So there was a kind of interest in this, but it wasn't going anywhere. You had in the UK, the, uh, the Blair government came to power and one of the bigger things they did was to make um, the International Development Department of the government a cabinet level role to really raise their focus on development, raise the amount of money going into it. And for the first time, the Department for International Development was responsible for a government wide white paper on globalization. And that white paper is the first place that you really see a major OECD government come out with a set of positions about, well, still expressed in terms of tax havens, but focusing on the development cost. Um, and you know, as one of the people who wrote background papers for that, there was a group of people, a pretty small group, who started to perhaps converge a little bit in that process. Round about the same time in 2000, Oxfam put out the first big international NGO paper on tax havens, arguing um, a set of things about the development costs in particular of this problem. And other people, including 
my predecessor at the Tax Justice Network, the, the founding director, John Christensen, who had been a chief economic advisor to the island of Jersey, um, was involved in the analysis that they did to put some, some big numbers on that development cost. So you had this process um, of some kind of intellectual convergence of people who were seeing this particularly as a development uh, problem. And that gave rise in 2003 to the establishment of the Tax Justice Network, a network of uh, professionals, lawyers, economists, accountants, political scientists, some philosophers, sociologists, in practice, in government, um, and in academia. And over the first couple of years, this, um, uh, the, the basic policy platform, um, which, which continues um, to be uh, important to this day, which we call the ABC of tax transparency. And these are really kind of the key measures that um, give us the basis to hope uh, that we can make you know, a dramatic step change against both tax avoidance and tax evasion um, as they uh, undermine uh, development and indeed high income countries. So the A is automatic exchange of tax information. At that point in time, the, the international standard is information exchange on request. So Zambia has a problem with a, uh, a Jersey um, company, let's say. Zambia has to write to Jersey specifically, and it has to be the right authority in Zambia writing to the right authority in Jersey and making the right sort of request for information about um, that company or indeed the whole of a bank account in Jersey. Jersey then considers this, and that can take a couple of years. Um, and then comes back with a decision which almost invariably is no. For some reason, you haven't met all of the criteria and we're not going to give you any information, even if you know, your investigation is still live, which it probably isn't because we've taken so long. Um, this system of information exchange on request you know, basically is a system for no information exchange. And so it was very clear that you know, having this as an automatic process, annually informing each other about what your citizens uh, or sorry, what the citizens of other countries are holding in bank accounts in your country is the only way to make that um, actually have some uh, impact. And I'll, I'll come back to, to that and also some of the, the issues that, that Brooke has raised with that, um, with the optimism uh, we have about that. The B uh, is another crucial part fitting into that beneficial ownership. If we don't have on public record who the actual warm-blooded human beings are who own companies and trusts and foundations, um, then none of this works. Um, we can't do even corporate taxation effectively. We certainly can't do individual taxation of incomes or wealth. Um, and you know, as, uh, as Raymond Baker of Global Financial Integrity is fond of saying, um, there's no good reason ever not to know who you're doing business with. Markets don't work better and states don't work better if you allow anonymous ownership, and yet we continue to uh, allow it. The C uh, of the ABC is country by country reporting by multinationals. Um, this is the requirement that you have to uh, produce annually um, data on where your economic activity is, your sales, your employment, and so on, and then where your profits are being declared and where your tax is being paid. You know, we have now something like a global consensus that profits ought to be aligned with the location of real economic activity. And yet we don't actually have the data to see whether that's true or not. And so people like me are, are reduced to doing estimates of it using the data we do have in public, which inevitably leaves you somewhere short of the final thing. Now, look, all three of these in that early period, when you put them to people at the OECD, in uh, treasuries, in, um, in the, uh, the professional bodies of accountants and so on, they were just laughed at. Well, actually, no, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. First of all, you had to explain what each of these things were. Once you'd finished doing that, then they laughed at you and said, you know, this is utopian, this is unrealistic, never happen. But 10 years later, um, I should probably click again. No, not there. Uh, 10 years later, this had become the agenda of the G20, the G8, the OECD. By 2013, the OECD had been requested to produce a country by country reporting standard for multinationals, not to require the data to be public, but that's the next step. Currently, just going to tax authorities. Um, beneficial ownership in public registers increasingly emerging as the international standard. Um, not there yet, but watch this space at the Financial Action Task Force and the Global Forum. We're, uh, we're on the way and you have European Union um, anti-money laundering directive that puts that in place, including for trust for the first time. 
There's still work to do to improve it, but we're getting there. Automatic exchange of information, as Brooke mentioned, the OECD's common reporting standard, which builds on the EU Savings Directive and the US Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, is now in place as a multilateral instrument, although deeply flawed for a whole set of ways I'll, I'll come back to. But you know, these things that were unthinkable are now the agenda. We haven't done them right yet, and we certainly haven't made sure they deliver the benefits they need to to lower income countries, but we're on the road, okay? The agenda has shifted. Okay, one of the things behind that was, um, you know, this uh, set of analyses of the kind of costs that we were suffering through different aspects. I'm just gonna focus here on the, um, the undeclared offshore assets. A series of estimates from that first Oxfam paper um, through various pieces of work by the Tax Justice Network and others, up to um, Gabriel Zuckman's um, book from his thesis, uh, The Hidden Wealth of Nations. Um, the numbers move a lot, partly because in sense there's a general trend of them getting bigger as we get better at bringing in different sorts of data and more data becomes available. Um, Gabriel's um, numbers are smaller. He's looking at much narrower type of financial um, assets. But, you know, uh, I've never heard anyone argue that 7.6 trillion is so small that we shouldn't worry about it. At some point, these numbers get so big that the, the, the difference between, you know, 7 and 21 trillion is perhaps not such a big deal. 7 trillion feels quite motivating um, to me. Uh, here are some more big numbers. Um, that's Jim's uh, lower and upper estimates. Um, at the bottom is um, the Boston Consulting Group's estimate, 156 trillion for the total of global private wealth. So, you know, if we take those numbers seriously, we're probably talking about, um, you know, 20, 30% perhaps, given that Jim's numbers are slightly out of date compared to the BCG ones um, being held offshore um, with a good chance of being undeclared to their home tax authorities. A first order global economic problem, even if we just consider it as a distortion that, you know, the, the, loops, uh, the, the, the hoops people are jumping through in order to achieve this position of secrecy, quite apart from anything else, is, you know, globally economically important, even if it didn't have a tax impact, that the amount of distortion that creates to all sorts of data that we use, all sorts of things in our understanding of economies and financial markets is significant. Okay, another big uh, piece in the kind of development of the, the thinking around this was Thomas Piketty's um, famous uh, book, Capital in the 21st Century. Um, and in there, at the time, it got a lot of attention, apart from the, the long run inequality uh, data, which really, I think, opened a lot of people's eyes to, to the patterns. Um, and that was only using data from tax authorities. So it doesn't include the data that tax authorities are ignorant of. Um, the proposal for a global wealth tax got a lot of the attention. From our point of view, probably the more interesting piece underneath that was the reason that Piketty was arguing for that, which was that it would require the creation of a global register of financial assets. You know, he draws a parallel with the French Revolution, which left behind it, apart from a lot of severed heads, um, one particular uh, legacy, which was a register of all the land ownership in France at a time when wealth was basically land. And that put in place something for the public and for governments into the future to track inequality and the basis for decision making about whether or not they wanted to tax that inequality um, and try and address it. The argument here is that a global, you know, nowadays wealth is financial and that's what we need to be aware of if we want to understand inequality, whether or not we actually want to um, go aggressively after it in terms of taxation. And of course, all the, other, all the other reasons why that information is useful, including for the whole set of um, activities against criminality. All right, needless to say, I am, I am very much biased in favor of uh, Thomas Piketty because he says nice things um, about us, um, uh, which are all true. Um, all right, uh, last piece, small numbers and big numbers. The work that Oxfam has done taking the Credit Suisse data and showing just how small is the X number of people who own assets equivalent to um, half of the world's population uh, has been you know, politically very important. And I'm not getting into the argument about whether you can add up negative wealth and positive wealth. Those numbers are extremely salient and have, have done a great deal of good to drive this argument forward. Um, more uh, rigorous, perhaps, the, the work of Alistair Setter and Johannesson and, and Gabriel Zuckman again, um, that Jim uh, referred to earlier something like 10% of world GDP being held in tax havens. And again, we'd rather they were focusing on secrecy jurisdictions, but still this is 
um, uh, interesting information. But a very big range and a number of the developing countries that they've looked at in particular having very, very high um, shares of GDP held offshore. That's entirely consistent with the work that Jim Henry's done on the price of offshore that I put up earlier. Um, the top 0.01% um, Welsh shares being, uh, you know, the uh, very large component of that. Um, but also very variable between countries. So we know that this isn't just the global elite everywhere behave like this. In fact, very big differences between how those, that same elite, if you like, behave in different contexts. And really worth thinking about in terms of Brooks' work, what are the drivers of that? What are the motivations of the people owning those assets and the people providing those secrecy services that gives us such differences um, in the, the behavior in terms of tax evasion? Okay, uh, on to, and I'm feeling like I should speed up a bit, uh, on to why should we try to tax wealth? The, the kind of primary reason is the four hours of tax, the joy of tax, right? You know, we, we tax for, we always think of revenue, right? And certainly that's, that's important. And in so many cases where we're looking for additional um, funds in order to provide basic public services, clearly crucial. But we shouldn't forget the rest. Redistribution, um, again, you know, so much evidence now on the cost of inequality, I'll mention a little bit more of that. In terms of repricing, if we can't tax effectively, then we can't make things like tobacco or pollution more expensive um, or other things that are good for us uh, cheaper. But the most important R of tax is representation. We all kind of uh, perhaps have in our minds the, the US independence rallying cry, no taxation without representation. It turns out in the research, it's pretty much the other way around. There's no effective representation if we don't have effective, especially direct taxation. It is the taxation that we don't like that is most visible. The taxation of income, capital gains, profits, and indeed wealth that drives the accountability relationship. If governments have natural resource revenues or aid in excess, or we're, we're only paying things like VAT that we don't really notice, the accountability relationship just doesn't function in the same way. We don't get annoyed about paying tax and we don't put demands on government about how they spend that. And over time, that means there's this very strong relationship between the share of tax and especially direct tax in total government expenditure with the development of effective political representation, the reduction of corruption, the strengthening uh, of governance. The point there, the state is not exogenous. We can't think about tax policy independent of the strength of the state. We have to think about what kind of taxes strengthen the state as well as delivering uh, on the other important features of uh, tax. All right, in terms of the cost of inequality, I will not go through the arguments because you will know them better than I do. Um, but, you know, up to and including all the work that the IMF's done in the last few years on the damage that um, inequality does, not just to human development in various um, uh, areas, but also directly to economic growth. Um, and that's kind of a key part of the argument, to have IMF researchers really put the nail in the coffin of the growth get out, which was always, you know, we don't like inequality, but actually it's good for growth and we just need to accept it. And then, you know, there'll be a trickle down and the people at the bottom will be better off too. Nonsense uh, on stilts, um, and you know, and very much um, uh, demonstrated to be so. Redistribution uh, itself likely to be pro-growth, um, certainly because of the benefits of getting to a lower inequality outcome. All right, final piece in this growing political demand. You know, at the Tax Justice Network and in the wider movement from 2003 to 2008. We really saw growing engagement, but at a lower level. So the start of media interest and wider coverage of this around the world and greater public um, interest. But it wasn't until the crisis um, that made particularly the public in high income OECD countries really aware of a lot of things that people in lower income countries were already very aware of um, in terms of the damage of tax avoidance and tax evasion to the provision of basic public services. The fact that the OECD policy response in terms of austerity in many countries has been so bad has actually extended the window of public anger and interest in taxation. Um, it's, a, it's an ill wind that blows uh, nobody any good. Um, and in that context, the set of leaks, the original offshore leaks, the um, HSBC private bank in Switzerland leaks, the Lux leaks about multinationals um, tax rulings, <laughs> And the Panama Papers, and who knows, perhaps another one coming down the down the track soon. Um, 
the response to them has been consecutively bigger in media terms and in terms of public anger. And it's really convinced politicians um, in, in all sorts of countries that this is an issue they need to keep returning to, not just rhetorically, but in demonstrating real policy change. One place that you see um, the kind of the global political moment confirmed there is in the sustainable development goals, the difference between them and the NDGs. Partly the shift from a kind of donor driven provision of social um, services type approach to one in which the primary means of implementation is tax and the policy context is, is uh, given a quite different importance, but also where inequalities in, in target in goal 10, but also actually throughout um, the whole framework are given a great deal of um, importance and where through um, target 16.4 to reduce illicit financial flows, we have the first global commitment, um, global rather than OECD or some other grouping, to reduce the global levels of tax evasion and tax avoidance. Okay, but despite all this, we're still basically not trying very hard in most cases to tax wealth. And so it's worth thinking about um, why not. Three kind of simple um, answers, really, one of which is I'm afraid to criticise um, our kind hosts. Elite politics, you don't need me to explain this, you know, as, as the pirates say, them who has the gold uh, makes the rules, this is the golden rule. Very difficult in many cases to get political consensus of the elite to tax the elite more. Um, and this is not a problem that we should minimize at all. You know, it's a genuine, deeply rooted political issue which doesn't go away when we put technical solutions in place or make them possible. Um, and we can't, uh, we can't ever forget the, the kind of the deep complexities of changing, in effect, the social contract in particular between the government and its own elite um, that's necessary to move to a different type of wealth taxation in particular. Okay, but those uh, elites um, also you know, rely on a great deal of lobbying and, and a couple of comforting myths in particular. First of all, that you mustn't scare the horses, that assets um, and the wealthy themselves are highly mobile. And actually, if they're not highly mobile, well, it's at least very easy for them to get citizenship in other places, to remain immobile, but have their tax um, citizenship move somewhere else. And that's a real problem that you know, we and the OECD and others are increasingly um, focusing on. But it's also the argument that tax is really what drives where people live. I don't buy that. You know, um, I have an ongoing discussion with, you know, people in Monaco about whether or not you live there if you're tax resident there. And people who are actually living there and genuinely committed to Monaco as the place that they're bringing up their children get really angry about people who are just using it for tax purposes, even though they themselves are perhaps there partly for tax purposes. How we separate out the substance and the form of where people are and their wealth um, is kind of an ongoing uh, challenge. And then the second myth, blessed are the job creators. You know, we shouldn't do anything about the wealthy because ultimately they're benefiting all of us. I think the IMF research and, and a lot of other research kind of shows that's, that's really not the case. And in fact, you know, um, what Jim mentioned and Jim Kim has talked about the human capital project, the idea within that, that you might redistribute physical and financial wealth in order to create a much better distribution of human capital wealth seems very powerful. If aliens looked at you know, came from outer space and looked at how we globally arrange ourselves for the taxation of wealth, the only thing they could possibly think is that we were firmly committed to making sure that we never achieved our potential by leaving so many people without so many of the basics that we could very easily provide to them and allow them to become um, much more uh, actively in control of their own, their own lives um, through investing in human capital. All right. In terms of the bank, we have a quite recent review of the uh, the bank's position, which unfortunately argues, um, you know, pretty compellingly that over a long period of time, the bank has focused neither on the efficiency of tax um, uh, taxation or on equity. To a fair extent, has followed the IMF, um, but hasn't necessarily been any better where it hasn't. Um, then a couple of other things to mention. One, the doing business indicators, working with PwC, one of the, the biggest enablers of multinational tax avoidance, to actually create something that puts pressure on governments to reduce their corporate taxation. Um, we might also look at the IFC, which has been, of all the development finance institutions, perhaps the one that's dragged its heels most in terms of 
any commitment to stop using secrecy jurisdictions as conduits for its investments, even though the evidence has grown substantially that using that sort of conduit significantly reduces the development benefit that you might get from their investment. The uh, IMF um, have been the main drivers of the tax uh, consensus. Um, now, I put those references up there just to make the point, although, you know, Cobham is clearly uh, a dangerous sort and not to be listened to. Chris Heady, Chris Adam and David Bevan are researchers who have worked with and in some cases in the IMF for many years. These aren't um, dangerous radicals and they're making the point that the tax approach has been limited and narrow in an extremely unhelpful way. It's taken the emphasis right off direct taxes as being distortionary and focus very much on indirect taxation with all the costs um, that that has the potential to bring if you don't have other policies um, in place. Now, people in this room, looking at Mick Keane in particular, have done a great deal of work in the, um, the Fiscal Affairs Department to show exactly why you shouldn't be following the tax consensus. But 10 years after, um, you know, one particularly important paper about the damage done by replacing trade uh, taxes with VAT, you still see country policy given by IMF staff saying, no, this is the way to go. This is the consensus. And we need to get through that distance between the research that's being done in organisations like the IMF and now the World Bank with the, the global tax team, which feels like a real step forward to a position where that is actively changing policy advice and ultimately policy. We can't have the same old, same old policy advice being given while the high level rhetoric moves on unrelated to, the, to that process. And I think that's a challenge for, you know, for us in the civil society world to keep pushing that accountability, but also for the people in these institutions who really do understand these issues very well to make sure that the policy advice that's coming out is informed by that. And I think, you know, we can be optimistic the last few years, it feels like those linkages are getting better, um, but we still need to see a com compelling shift across the, the board. Um, is, is, you know, the IMS uh, fiscal monitor just this month saying a whole set of very positive things. I want to see this in, uh, in country advice. All right, finally, um, two technical obstacles and solutions, the answers being information, information and information. Um, uh, Vicky mentioned the, the work I've done on what I call the uncounted. It's this idea that people at the bottom are in all sorts of ways not counted in surveys and all sorts of other data that's then used to set policy so that they are further marginalised, they suffer greater inequality because they're not counted, while at the same time people at the top use their power, as, as Brooke has told us, to themselves to become invisible, to become uncounted, which in turn drives higher inequality. If we're concerned here, as we are with the taxation of wealth, and we're focusing very much at the top of the distribution where so much of the wealth is, then it's that problem of uncounted, it's how we unpick that, that we have to um, consider. Um, again, just to, to go back to the, the other paper this year from Alstad Setter and Johannesson and, and Zuckman, very clear findings about the extent to which the very wealthy are willing to commit pretty blatant evasion by separating themselves on paper from the ownership um, of their wealth. Until we can challenge that, we cannot tax wealth, or at least our wealth taxes will be at best middle class property taxes. Okay. So the ownership of wealth is the information that we need. Um, now the end of bank secrecy, this opening up of the automatic information exchange process is an important step forward, ending some of the more traditional forms of anonymous ownership. But of course, we also need to see public registers of beneficial ownership across the board, companies, trusts and foundations, each of the type of vehicles that Brooks talked about as being um, integral to the process of um, creating anonymous ownership and um, I think we need to at least explore this idea of a global financial registry linking that all up with taxpayer identifications to make sure the information or the lines join up, that there aren't big black holes suddenly where um, if you have a trust in, in Jersey, then that's it, end of the, end of the search. All right, so exchange is important. Thinking within um, tax authorities about how we use information is also critical and the, the research done at the International Centre for Tax and Development with the Ugandan Revenue Authority shows some really interesting ideas about how we join up existing data that tax revenue uh, authorities have, but also how you expand information exchange networks, make sure you're getting more information from uh, outside. 
crucial thing to think about there, probably the best evidence we have on this for the IRS um, in the United States, when there is automatic provision of information to the tax authority by third parties, the tax compliance rate without any enforcement activity goes up seven or eight fold, you know, really dramatic, even though everyone knows the IRS can't deal with the amount of data that it has. Um, and in most cases, you're unlikely ever to be um, investigated. Simply knowing that there is third party automatic provision of information has a dramatic impact on compliance. Having automatic exchange of information um, and having knowing that your country is participating in it, um, we can expect, even with no other changes, to have quite a significant impact. But of course, that raises the question of which countries are included in the common reporting standard. Um, and the OECD's exchange network has shifted, unfortunately, from being global um, in theory, fully multilateral, to actually allowing this dating process so that Switzerland, for example, can say, ah, well, we've signed up, but in fact, we're only going to exchange information with a handful of countries, the ones with such big economies that they have a big enough stick to threaten us with. Everyone else, well, you're on your own. You're where you were. Um, the impact of that and very rigid reciprocity requirements is that the benefits so far as, as the CRS kicks off um, this year, much less than we might have expected for lower income countries. This is a mapping from a um, uh, uh, doctoral student at the University of Ghent, Walter Lips, um, of the relationships that currently exist. And you can see the great core of that, the red part in the centre, is exchange happening within the European Union. There's then a set of hubs, including um, South Africa and a number of other lower income countries, relatively fully engaged. Most developing countries just are not represented on this map. They don't have access, partly because they aren't yet at the place where they can reciprocate. Not that Zambia is holding useful information about Swiss citizens. This is really an excuse to keep them out. Um, but also because of this, um, the, the fact it's collapsed into allowing bilateral deals and Switzerland has no incentive to do a bilateral deal with, uh, with Zambia or indeed a great many other jurisdictions. Finally, I think I've talked about the kind of public information we have and I'm over my time, so I will skip through. Domestic opportunities are these, you know, we know we can set a course for progressive tax, but it requires thinking through the politics of the social contract underneath that. Um, but we can certainly put in place the information basis to do it, at least make it possible technically and then see where the politics takes us. There's a lot of work that can be done in terms of best practice with information. And we could talk through um, some of that in questions if that's useful. In terms of preparing for wealth tax, it really is getting ready to be part of the common reporting standard and ensuring that there is pressure for that standard to be um, open up and potentially to take countermeasures against jurisdictions that don't provide the necessary transparency that is now the global standard if you're an OECD country. Global opportunities, you know, and this is something that the organisations represented in this room could do a lot about, putting pressure on the OECD to make sure that the CRS really is the multilateral instrument that it claimed to be to make sure it is global um, and some flexibility on reciprocity. Um, the SDG indicators that for the illicit flows target still haven't been set. We need to defend the inclusion of multinational tax avoidance in there, but in terms of wealth tax, we need to think about targets that will, or indicators that will put pressure and create accountability on countries in terms of who they're exchanging information with, um, so that we can see, we can rank, we can name and shame um, financial centres that are technically part of the CRS, but are choosing, in fact, not to share information with very many um, particularly lower income countries. Also pressure in terms of whether you're registering your um, legal entities or not. One possibility for the next few years is to put all of this together into an international financial transparency convention, and that's something that's under active discussion to establish these standards um, as the norms and potentially the basis for countermeasures. Um, and finally, to explore the potential for a global financial registry joining up ownership data as we have it to create a very powerful um, single tool. There is an enormous amount more uh, in all of this, but I've gone on far too long, so I will leave you with um, a picture of one of the major problems uh, in, in the world of financial secrecy um, and say thank you very much. Thank you, Alex.